One of the most frequently asked questions for me in conjunction with the phone show is why on earth do you still film it on an old Nokia 808? And yes, this is my spare. One of the core USPs of the phone show, or the smartphone show as it used to be called at the start, and I kind of wish I'd stuck to the name now, was that it was filmed on a phone. The idea was to demonstrate that I was living the smartphone lifestyle in every aspect, including creating content. No fancy film studio for me, you can probably tell. And thanks mainly to Nokia phone camera hardware that constantly seemed to be ahead of the curve, I was able to do just that. Yes, the show started on an old school analogish video camera. Remember, this was 2006, wow. But then there was the whole digitization from the video, quality was never perfect, and the whole juggling process became very burdensome. Then the likes of the Nokia N93 appeared with VGA quality and stereo sound unheard of on a phone before. And I got to thinking, why not just shoot my videos on the phone? And then they'd spit out a nice neat MP4 file that could be edited directly on my computers. Keep it all digital and so forth. Of course, quality improved over the years in parallel with the development of YouTube itself. The smartphone show predated YouTube by a few months, but I quickly latched on to this new way of distributing content and I raised resolution with it from QVGA to VGA to 720p and finally to 1080p over the last three years. I'd go to 4K, but most people still can't watch it comfortably. And anyway, I want people to see less of my grey hairs and wrinkles, not more. So I went through the Nokia N93, the N82, the N86, the N8, and finally the 808 PureView here, all running Symbian, though that's not strictly relevant here. The Nokia phones almost always had the best audio and video quality, and I've tested quite a few devices. The 808 in particular struck a home run in that there's a huge sensor plus a hardware chip oversampling down to 1080p in real time. So the digital noise in this picture that you're watching is effectively zero and with stereo high amplitude microphones, making sure that the audio is crystal clear. Yes, the a 208 is well over three years old, but it's still the best for what I do here. Now, wait a minute, you'll say, what about the exposure issues? Whenever you flash a, a bright phone screen towards the camera, you may have noticed that in past shows. It's not doing it this time. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'd completely forgotten that the 808 has another trick up its sleeve, exposure lock when shooting video, as well as focus lock and everything else. How on earth did I get to phone show 271 and forget about this? Oh well, it proves I'm human. You could ask why I don't use a modern DSLR or digital video camera instead. Just me being stubborn, I guess. Why give up my USP after all this time? You could ask why I don't use a home studio and proper lighting. If I could do it all over again, I probably would. I'd make the investment, but there's no room in our family house for too much gear. I already get shouted at sometimes. Of course, this is for filming content in a controlled environment on a tripod. For real world videos, you're gonna want optical or digital stabilization. And that's where more modern imaging flagships score, of course. In the meantime though, here's to the 808 still at the helm. In a world of Android phones and phablets that are almost interchangeable, let's be honest, this has come along and stood out. And for much the same reason as I've championed Nokia phones, see the feature in the last few minutes, in the past for innovative imaging. Here in the Asus Zenfone Zoom, we have a genuine bona fide three times optical zoom. No, it doesn't shoot out from the back or make the phone unpocketable or let dust in, like the uh, Galaxy K Zoom, cough, cough. Um, just like the Lumia 1020 back in the day, this is all internal, except that this time the light entering the camera is bent twice through 90 degrees, meaning that the lengthy zoom optics can be sat parallel to the display itself. I was skeptical given that the aperture, which ranges from f over 2.7 as is to f over 4.8 when zoomed, my guess was that this would be horrible in anything other than sunlight. And I was wrong. The Zenfone Zoom produces zoomed images which are right up with most other camera phones in terms of low light noise. Quite astonishing. And it's thanks to high quality Hoya optics and a dedicated image processor with good algorithms. And happily a barrage of firmware updates over the last month as Asus keep tweaking it all. This is one of their flagships after all. There's the usual mess when using LED flash for people indoors which almost no phone gets right. There, there it is an official Zenfone Zoom Xenon accessory which plugs into the micro USB port. 
It sounds like a clutch, but hey, I'll try and report back to this in a phone show chat in the future. See some of these photo samples anyway, zoomed and unzoomed, with a two-stage physical shutter button, laser focusing, OIS and a 13 megapixel smart front side illuminated sensor, plus more shooting modes and things to experiment with than a Galaxy S5 in heat. The Zenfone Zoom, as the name suggests, is very definitely a camera-centric phone. Video captures at 1080p max, and sadly in mono only, though there are microphones both end of the Zenfone Zoom, so hopefully a stereo audio upgrade is coming down the line. Zooming and OIS seem to work well in video mode too, plus there's digital stabilisation as well, a terrific combination spoiled only by some, well, usual persistent autofocus hunting issues. The camera's mounted in a circular island, somewhat artificially, it's clearly heavily heavily influenced by Nokia's Lumia 1020 here, though it's well done and hey the old Nokia aren't around to sue Asus anymore anyway. The camera glass is neatly recessed but looks a little broken. What you're seeing is that one side of the circular lens gap is straightened off. It looks odd at first but it's simply the beginning of the straight edges of the first of two 45 degree mirrors and that's how the magic works. The rest of the back is plastic, faux leather, but nicely textured for maximum grip, which is just as well as the metal edges of the Zenfone Zoom are thin, curved and easy for fingers to slip on. There's a big ridge across the back here to keep the phone from rocking around when you lay it flat on a desk. And it also keeps the rather average speaker sound from getting muffled. Here's a demo of the speaker. This is a full volume. It's all a bit tinny. Not unimpressive, but it's loud enough for the average user. On such a media-centric, camera-centric, video-centric phone, though, I would have expected better. Around the front, things are much more usual. A 5.5-inch IPS LCD Gorilla Glass 4 display, allied to rather large bezels, top, bottom and side, make this a fablet, definitely a two-handed device. It's rather painful to know that the hardware is very similar in size to the Nexus 6, which has a full six inch screen in exactly the same form factor. Ouch! Capacitive controls give the full screen to work with at least. It can go very bright indeed, but the automatic controls keep the backlight in check well, and this helps give the Zenfone Zoom good battery life. I got through a normal day with complete ease. There's a sealed 3000 milliamp hour battery inside, and I never needed to top this up with a micro USB power bank. You would have thought that USB Type-C was the way to go for a 2016 handset, but remember, the Zenfone Zoom was first shown off in early 2015, and it's a relatively old design. The Zoom is fully quick charge 2.0 compatible too, though not with the full range of voltages seen in some other flagships. Happily, Asus has been bumping up the internals as they move the Zenfone Zoom to production. This comes with a maximum 128 gigabytes of internal storage, plus micro SD, so that's 256 gigabytes if you stick in a media SD card, plus the unusual 64-bit Atom Z3590 processor, provisioned with a full four gigabytes of RAM. In terms of specifications, this thing is a beast. Unhappily, it's also a beast in terms of software. Not that anything's buggy, just that Asus likes to provide the end user with just about anything they'll ever need. The user interface isn't that far from stock Android 5.1, but you won't believe the amount of stuff that Asus has included. From Asus versions of all the normal Android built-in apps, to Asus Web Storage, to Power & Boost, to Do It Later, to TripAdvisor, to the rightly reviled Clean Master, to Zinio, to Puffin, to Shortcuts, to a dozen Gameloft freemium titles. Not enough for you? There's also Asus Mobile Manager, Asus Support, Audio, Audio Wizard, Auto Start Manager, My Asus, Laser Ruler, Photo Collage, Zen Talk, Zen Circle, Zen UI, uh, and Splendid. What, what? And that's not even a definitive list of add ons, and it doesn't include all the PIM and standard apps and variants. About half of these are uninstallable, but half aren't, in a similar manner to the TouchWiz app loadouts on Samsung devices. Some of the additions are especially welcome, though, with System Update and here Power Saver breaking out two possibly hard to find sets of settings in uh, settings into icons that are easy to find and tap on to check for OS updates and here obviously to choose which power profile should be used. Most of this will re represent a learning curve to a new user, but they'll appreciate having everything spoon fed to them 
as an android old hand I was disturbed a little to see quite so much bloat and disturbed a lot by, for example, the hated clean master popping up dialogues and suggestions about low level functions, even when it wasn't supposed to have even been auto started in the first place. And when I hadn't started it manually, is it effectively a rootkit? Happily, clean master is one of the applications that you can uninstall. Just do it. So what else do you need to know? There's NFC, not always a given for phones from the Far East in recent times, but befitting the price tag of around £350 imported in the UK. Not premium, but also not cheap, as you'd expect with the camera specs here, of course. Bluetooth is top spec with the aptX codec for supported accessories to get the highest fidelity sound. Oh, and there's no LTE Band 20, which won't be an issue for all parts of the world, but is a pain in the UK and Europe where I live, since at least one of the main networks only uses Band 20 for its LTE, and so it's 3.5G at best. Not a showstopper, but worth noting. So the Zenfone Zoom is big, heavy, bulky, and bloated with applications, and its LTE may not suit everyone. But despite all this, it's powerful, and it does have a USB, a unique selling point that lifts it from the Android mainstream. If, like me, your phone has to be your camera, and if you find yourself wanting to add zoom into many daily shots to get up closer with your subjects effectively, then this is definitely worth considering, warts and all.